loved his hockey. It was their thing. He was so present in his son's life. They did everything together. He was meant to take care of kids and give them a second chance. Ricardo Hebe is doing everything he can to be a positive influence in these kids' life. He's stabbed three times in the chest and he's left for dead. Is there an old score to settle? Is this something from Ricardo's past? We have this murderer out on the streets. Everybody was scared. A lot of the details were just so gruesome. The final moments of Ricardo Hebe's life must have been horrifically terrifying. December 2018, Winnipeg, Canada. Ricardo Hebe has a lot to be grateful for this holiday season. He and his fiancée Candace are planning a big wedding in the new year. And he's found success in the real estate business. But growing up in Winnipeg's North End, this happy picture was far from guaranteed. North End Winnipeg is... A um, place that has substance abuse issues, issues related to crime. It's a city that has some real struggles. Ricardo's early years, he had a lot of tumultuous relationships in his life with family or guardians. He kind of had to navigate on his own. We went to the same high school. His energy was so enigmatic, like everybody wanted to be around him. We just met one night and the rest was history. His parents separated when he was young. They both left Winnipeg. He stayed because he didn't want to leave. So he ended up staying with one of his friends. We talked about his childhood, it was very broken. On Ricardo's 16th birthday, an act of kindness changes his life. One of his friends, his mom took him in. She was a single mom raising her own kids, and she was a foster mom as well. She just took him in, supporting him. As long as he went to school, that was the deal. And he kept that deal with her and got good grades. He was actually an honor roll student. He calls her super mom. After Ricardo graduates from high school in 2002, he is touched by another act of kindness that changes his life. We met through a mutual friend of ours, Sean. I've been doing home renovations and construction for 15 years now. He's like, oh, would you mind if I worked with you? I'm not going to get paid. I just wouldn't mind, you know, somebody teaching me how to do these things. I said, yeah, absolutely. Over the next several years, Ricardo learns Richard's business and eventually becomes his partner. He was successful in real estate. Like, he could have retired probably by the time he was 45 if he would have kept at it. Then, in December 2010, when he's 26 years old, a mutual friend introduces him to Candace Velasha. He was this mean-looking guy, but so friendly and nice. So he was laughing his smile right away. And then we just hit it off there. He said, you're mine. And I said, okay. He ended up signing his name on me that night. And I came home, and my mom was like, what the hell is on you? And I was like, oh, God. I was like, I found my, my love. I'm like, he signed me. So we're like, we're stuck together now. I was like, I found my forever. And I did. I really did. A year and a half later, Candace gives birth to a baby boy. I can't even explain it, just seeing his eyes holding Junior, that was his world. Everything was about him. He had to be with him 24 seven. On 
On December 14, 2014, two years after Junior is born, Ricardo asks Candace to marry him. He was really excited to get married. That was kind of the last little bit to solidify their family as a unit. But a chance encounter puts those plans on hold. A couple of friends were doing group homework, and I think when he went there, he looked at these youth, and he saw part of himself in these kids. A group home is an environment where multiple people who are vulnerable live together. And it really hits home that these teenagers are just like him, who need stability, who need guidance. Ricardo decides that the best way to repay the acts of kindness that turn his life around is to create his own group home for at-risk teens. He just kind of followed his calling. He was meant to take care of kids and, you know, and give them a second chance. Transforming a property he owns into a group home takes several months and becomes Ricardo's sole focus. He even decides to postpone his wedding so he can fully concentrate on his newfound mission. He signed up with an agency, which then certified him. He was approved, and three teenagers were placed in his care. He gets to do what he loves, and he gets to keep kids off the street. And the kids loved him. He would take them to the gym. He was adamant on them going to school. He did everything with them. He wanted them to do better. They would laugh, like they would even call him the dad. They looked up to him. It was like home. We'd have supper there with the kids. Our kid was there all the time. By the winter of 2018, four years after he proposed to Candace, Ricardo is ready to plan their long overdue wedding. We planned his wedding party. I was supposed to be the best man in his wedding. He wanted to proceed with it and to get married. As Christmas approaches, Ricardo takes his family out for one of the favorite activities he enjoys sharing with his son. Cheering on the Winnipeg Jets. He loved his hockey. It was their thing. Like every Jets game they'd be watching, screaming. He just wanted him to be, his main thing was hockey. That's what he wanted him to do. It was him and his son at the Jets game. He had season tickets, so he would always go to all the games and bring his son. He was so present in his son's life. They did everything together. You could just see he's just so happy and laughing. They don't know that this happy night will be their final moments together as a family. On December 17th, Ricardo agrees to give his former business partner a hand with one of his construction jobs. At lunchtime, he tells Richard he's got to go run an errand. I remember it vividly. Every time we leave for the night, we're not going to see each other till the next day. He would always do like this side fist bump to me. And so the day of... He was saying he has to go home, and he's going to get something to eat, and he'll meet me back at the house. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. And then he did one of those fist bumps. And I remember it's, it was like my brain took a picture of it because I looked over and I seen his hand. And I remember like almost taking a picture of my hand touching his hand. I looked at his hand, and I pulled my hand back. And I was thinking in my head, I'm like, I'm going to see you in 20 minutes. I just had this intuition that that was the last time I was going to speak to him.
At 2.30 p.m., a call comes in to the Winnipeg police reporting a disturbance at Ricardo Hebe's group home. Ricardo Hebe was on the phone with a lawyer at the time. So the lawyer hears a commotion, knows that there's something wrong. The lawyer calls 911 and patrol units are immediately dispatched to Ricardo's group home. They find Ricardo Hebe on the ground, covered in blood. Detectives try to decipher a clue that could crack the case. Somebody is lying. Somebody knows something about that blood stain on the door. While they grapple with the question of who would want Ricardo Hebe dead. We have the citizens coming together in uproar, thinking, what is going on in our city? What did he do wrong? Nothing. He opened the door. He's trying to defend his home and defend the, the children in his care. I didn't see real. I lost it because it was like a nightmare. Winnipeg police responding to the group home run by Ricardo Hebe find him critically injured after being attacked and clinging to life. You're looking at a chaotic scene. He's stabbed three times in the chest. He's left for dead. He's bleeding out. They're going to do whatever they can to save his life. The paramedics take him to the hospital as quickly as possible. As Ricardo fights for his life, the search for clues about what happened to him immediately gets underway. The forensic unit attend the crime scene and collect all the blood samples. They're going to collect DNA samples from different surfaces. Maybe the, the offender uh, got caught in a, in a struggle and has blood on the floor. Detectives also launch an urgent search for witnesses. They discover that two of the three teenaged residents of the group home were in the house when Ricardo was attacked. These kids, he said, they were in their rooms at the time when this happened. The investigators have to consider everything and everyone. This attack could have been connected to any one of the three boys that live there. As the investigators interview the teens at the crime scene, they have their colleagues back at the police station check into the residents' backgrounds. Investigators ask the gang unit and in the, the drug unit if there's any open investigations involving the, the group home or the, the people who live in the group home. But they find the opposite, that Ricardo Hebe is running a really clean ship and he's uh, doing everything he can to be a positive influence in these kids' life. They actually have a lot of respect for him and they speak very highly of him. The teens also tell the police there's one more resident of the group home who's known to everyone as CH, but they haven't seen him all day. CH was not there at the time. It's imperative that the investigators find CH and interview him as well. Detectives get the addresses of CH's school and work and begin trying to track him down. As they do, word comes that this has just become a homicide case. Ricardo Hebe was pronounced dead at the hospital. Ricardo's fiance Candace is home when she gets the call that turns her world upside down. Hearing the words that he's dead. I didn't see real. I lost it, because it was like a nightmare. <sighs> I couldn't speak, I couldn't think, I couldn't breathe half the time. I would lay there like begging him to come back. He was my everything. Losing him literally destroyed my life. <sighs> <sighs> oh, 
I'll never forget that phone call because all I could hear was Ricardo's dead. And instantly I dropped the phone. I couldn't breathe. I fell down. I was crying. Thank God my husband was carrying our child because I was completely distraught. It was just heart-wrenching. As Ricardo's stunned loved ones try to cope with the terrible news, Winnipeg detectives continue looking for reasons and potential suspects. Why did the suspect do this? Is there a, an old score to settle? Is this maybe something from Ricardo's way past and somebody has asked this guy to go there and kill him? Who knows? But you have to, you can't rule out any of these options. He didn't have any enemies. He didn't have anybody that had a personal vendetta against him. He never screwed somebody over. Investigators examining the crime scene make a major discovery that they hope will shed light on what happened. There's a camera showing the exterior of the residence, so it would show anyone coming up to the door. Police are able to quickly review the surveillance video, and when they do, they learn the camera was an eyewitness to the murder. They are able to play back Ricardo Hebe's final moments. The surveillance footage shows a man in a black coat walking up to the group home. There is a brief interaction. You can't hear what's said, but the man in the black coat pulls out a knife stabs Ricardo three times. The crime was shocking. Here's a guy who is running a group home for vulnerable children. What did he do wrong? Nothing. He opened the door. He's trying to defend his home and defend the, the children in his care. And then he gets stabbed. The final moments of Ricardo Hebe's life must have been horrifically terrifying. Despite showing the murder, the footage yields no clues to the identity of Ricardo's killer. Unfortunately, the images are grainy, they're fuzzy, and they're just not good. The exterior camera showed uh, the suspect wearing a black jacket with a fur-trimmed hood. The hood was up. The footage shows that Ricardo's attacker approached from the street and never entered the house. The two kids who were in the house, they're ruled out at this point. For detectives, it's now more urgent to find the one resident who was not home at the time of the murder, C.H. It's imperative that the investigators find C.H. and interview him. Maybe he knows something that the other kids didn't know. And also to be able to account for his uh, location at the time the offense happened. It's not clear where C.H. was at the time of Ricardo Hebe's death. Police are just trying to piece together if he's connected to all of this. The day after Ricardo Hebe is stabbed to death, Detectives are urgently searching for the one resident of Ricardo's group home who cannot be accounted for, a teen known to his friends as C.H. At this point, the investigators still haven't tracked down C.H. The first obvious place to check would be the school and his place of work. It turns out that he didn't attend either of them on that day, which is a little weird because he was expected to be in school and he was scheduled to be at work, but he didn't show up for either. And there's no account of where he is or where he could be. So they cannot rule him out or rule him in in any way at this point. News of Ricardo's murder spreads through Winnipeg, stirring both grief and anger. Yeah. 
This was quite a high profile murder in Winnipeg. It affected a lot of people. And the question I kept coming back to was, for what? Why did this happen? There's really no clear answer. I thought it was just so brutal because of the fact that Ricardo was quite a pillar in the north end of Winnipeg. It was just such a sad story. I mean, this man dedicated his life to trying to help young men who were in a similar position to him, so it seemed just so tragic that he would die while doing something good for the community. It just felt very cold and brutal. We have the citizens coming together in uproar, thinking, what is going on in our city? We have this murderer out on the streets. We're all going out in support because we don't want this to die in the media. We want it to be up close and personal with every resident of this city because this is all of our issue. You know, it was my best friend who lost his life, but it could be my neighbors tomorrow. Everybody was scared. And so I think pushing it in the media was the only way that we were going to get any traction with finding this guy. Two days after Ricardo Hebe's murder, as detectives continue to search for CH, police get an unexpected visitor. On December 19th, CH arrived at police headquarters and tells the officer at the desk that he understands that homicide investigators want to speak to him. He tells police that he doesn't know who would have had reason to attack Ricardo. He doesn't believe it had anything to do with him. He certainly denies being part of the attack or having any knowledge whatsoever of it. The investigators want to know where was he at the time of the attack. CH tells the investigators that he, he was at his girlfriend's house. His alibi is that he spent the whole afternoon with her and that's why he didn't go to school and that's why he didn't go to work. He said that he was dealing with some relationship issues and that's why he hadn't come forward. And he claims that he didn't know anything about the homicide until he had recently heard about it, that police wanted to speak with him. CH says that he was with his girlfriend, Trinity Moore. Police now have to confirm that alibi. C.H. gives detectives Trinity's address. They head straight to her house to check his story. When police arrive at uh, Trinity's address, they see that there's a blood stain on her front door. Trinity denies any knowledge of it, and she says that's the first time that she's seen that blood. Trinity consents to police taking samples from the blood that's found on her front door. The blood samples are sent to the police lab for testing as detectives continue their interview with Trinity. They ask if she can confirm CH's alibi, that he was with her on December 17th, the day of the murder. Trinity told the investigators that CH does come over a lot and he stays over there and he spends lots of time with her at her home. However, she says that on the day of the homicide, he was not there. In fact, Trinity tells the detectives she hasn't seen CH in days. He's saying that he was there all day. She said, no, he wasn't. So someone's lying. Somebody knows something about that blood stain on the door. Detectives investigating the stabbing death of Ricardo Hebe believe a teenage resident of Ricardo's group home has lied to them about where he was at the time of the murder. 
CH says that he was with his girlfriend, Trinity Moore, but she said that she didn't see CH that day. With his alibi in doubt, investigators now wait to see if DNA tests on the blood found on Trinity's door can connect CH to the murder. But they also have some follow-up questions for him. This time, CH is easier to locate. They find him standing outside the group home where he lives. CH tells them that Trinity is mistaken. And he said that sometimes she takes medication and she forgets things. But he's actually angry that she says that he wasn't there because he is adamant that he was there. His alibi is very shaky. But there is no physical evidence to tie him to the scene. At this point, there is certainly not enough evidence to charge CH with anything. Four days after Ricardo's murder, just four days before Christmas, the DNA test results from the blood stains on Trinity's door come in. Those blood stains came back as a match to Ricardo Hebe's DNA. It is not contaminated with anybody else's DNA. It is Ricardo Hebe's DNA, and it is definitely something that happened after his attack. This is a huge break in the case because now there is a direct link from the crime scene to Trinity's front door. So somebody who killed Ricardo went through that front door and deposited Ricardo's blood on the door. The test results convince detectives that Trinity knows more than she's told them about how Ricardo's blood got on her door. They rush back to her home to confront her. And that's when her story about the day of the murder changes. She says that CH was there that he was actually hiding in the back room. Trinity told the investigators that they have a rocky relationship at this time and they had a fight. She says her brother, Kane, became aware of the altercation that she had had with CH and was furious. She didn't tell her brother that CH was in the back room and her brother, Kane, left and he went looking for CH. She actually provided her brother with the address of the group home. And when he came back, he had blood on him, and as he left the blood on the door handle at the front of the house. She says that he shows up, she sees his hands are bloody, and she uh, sees him in possession of a knife, and she observes there's blood on it. Was he looking to find CH and thought he killed CH? Or was he just lashing out at somebody? There's a couple of different possibilities here. The investigators show Trinity the images from the security camera from the front of the house where the attack is captured. She actually tells the investigators that her brother Kane has a jacket like that. Trinity told investigators that she hadn't seen her brother since the day of Ricardo's murder. She lied to police because she didn't want to get her brother in trouble. She was trying to protect her boyfriend as well. With Trinity's statement, CH is cleared of any suspicion. Now the investigation has taken a completely different turn. It looks now like Kay Moore is the number one suspect. Once he was identified as a suspect, the investigators are going to look at his record. Kane had a history of violence. He had a history of unprovoked attacks. Kane went to Stony Mountain, uh, which is just outside Winnipeg. It's a, a federal prison. It's for serious and violent offenders. While he's in the penitentiary, he's involved in another serious incident. He's a suspect in another stabbing inside in the penitentiary. Kane was facing charges related to the death of another inmate. 
Despite the pending charges, investigators learned that in October 2018, two months before Ricardo was stabbed to death, Kane Moore was granted parole and released from prison. He's a very dangerous person, but he was not designated a dangerous offender by the courts. He wasn't even supposed to be out on the street. In his parole documents, it stated that he is high risk to reoffend, and somehow he was let out. When I found out, I was furious. How do you allow someone out who killed someone inside? If you can't protect people in there, how are you supposed to protect them out? He's very volatile and he's got a very dangerous background. So it's urgent to find him as soon as possible. Winnipeg detectives are on the hunt for 21-year-old Kane Moore, the prime suspect in the murder of Ricardo Hebe. At this point of the investigation, the investigators have to find Kane Moore. It is imperative that they find Kane Moore. Kane's sister, Trinity, tells the detectives that she has not seen or heard from him since December 17th, the day of the murder. Investigators begin tracking down other family members, hoping for a lead to his whereabouts. His family are somewhat cooperative. Uh, they say that they haven't seen him in quite some time, but it can only be taken at face value because they could quite easily shelter him. The investigators went to all the known hangouts and the areas where Ken Moore has frequented and is known to frequent. They're not getting the best cooperation in these neighborhoods. Uh, nobody wants to be seen speaking to the investigators. Nobody certainly wants to cooperate with them. And they draw a blank. They're not getting anywhere. Kane Moore's parole has been revoked at this point. It's helped the investigators to get a Canada-wide warrant for Kane Moore. They'd circulate a bulletin with his picture and uh, his description to every officer. After two weeks of an intensive search that began just before Christmas, police still have no sightings of Kane. Nobody knows where he is. It looks like he's gone to ground and nobody can find him. He's on the run. It was a brutal holiday season for Ricardo's friends and family. They're dealing with this awful tragedy, but they also have no answers. There are very few details at this point about where the main suspect in this murder is. It took a huge toll on me, physically, mentally. I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping from the stress of it. That just completely shattered everybody. It's unexplainable. My brain was numb. I just I was trying to, you know, soak in the shock. Another week goes by with no progress in the manhunt. Then, on January 6th, 2019, Cadets that work with the Winnipeg Police Service came across an individual that was just walking around, walking on the street, and they were concerned that he was intoxicated. They approached the individual who provided them with a false name. However, when they detained him for being intoxicated and they searched his pocket, they found identification in the name of Kane Moore with a photograph that matched him. Once cadets clue in and realize that they have the main suspect in Ricardo Hebe's murder, they call detectives immediately. The cadets take Kane into custody and bring him to the station. Kane Moore was arrested wearing a black winter jacket. The man who appeared in the surveillance video taken of Ricardo Hebe's death was also wearing a black jacket. 
But when detectives show Kane the images from Ricardo Hebe's security camera, he insists it's not him. He doesn't give anything up. Kane Moore clams up. He denies any involvement in the murder, and he asks for a lawyer. Kane Moore never admits to attacking Ricardo Hebe, and he never admits to killing him. But when investigators examine the jacket Kane was wearing when he was arrested, they make a critical discovery. Police found blood stains inside that jacket. Investigators test the blood that's found in this black jacket, and the DNA matches Ricardo Hebe's DNA. Kane Moore is arrested for the murder of Ricardo Hebe. There's a lot of inexplicable killings that occur, uh, but in this case, even though there was no a clear motive, there is enough evidence to suggest that uh, Mr. Moore was upset uh, with CH. Kane Moore wanted to get into the house to find CH, and Ricardo locked him. He was protecting the kids in his house and doing what he was supposed to do. And Kane Moore wanted to get in there and lashed out the way he always does, violently. Kane Moore is charged with one count of second-degree murder. Ricardo Hebe's loved ones are shocked to find out he was killed by a stranger. Kane Moore, he's never been around us. We never had him at the house. Like, we had no idea who he was. The news kind of came out that it was just some random guy. I was angry. We'll ever sit down and have a conversation if this guy asked me for forgiveness. I don't think I could do that. Kane Moore's trial begins in September 2020. Prosecutors are confident they have the evidence to convict him of murder. They call their star witness, Trinity Moore, the accused killer's sister, to the stand and ask her about what she saw the day Ricardo was murdered. Trinity Moore gave a sworn statement to police that her brother Kane Moore showed up and she saw he had bloody hands. Trinity Moore recants her statement when she's called as a witness. She tells a completely different story. When Trinity Moore changed her story, now there's the possibility of an acquittal. Kane Moore is on trial for the murder of Ricardo Hebe. Prosecutors expect his sister, Trinity, to testify that he came to her home after the murder, covered with blood, and confessed. But her testimony stuns them. When she gets up on the stand, she completely contradicts what she had told investigators. She says that her brother was not involved and never came over. She said that when she spoke to police, she didn't know what she was saying because she was high and drunk at the time. When Trinity made the, the 180 turn on her story, it throws a wrench in the prosecution's case. But even without Trinity's testimony, prosecutors can make their case to the jury solely based on the physical evidence. That black coat that Kane Moore was arrested wearing wound up being a central piece of evidence. There was video surveillance and forensic DNA evidence. We played the surveillance videos that show the individual approaching the residence, and we showed the actual stabbing. We also showed Kane Moore leaving the house. The video surveillance and then the forensic DNA evidence links him to that house. Candace was there every single day 
She seemed extremely strong given the circumstances, but when that surveillance video was played in court, she left sobbing, but she was there start to finish. I don't really know how she did it because a lot of the details were just so gruesome. The jury deliberates for six hours. And on September 24th, 2020, reaches its verdict. He was convicted of second degree murder. He's got a life sentence with no chance of parole for 15 years. For Ricardo's family and friends, the sentence only adds to their pain. He did not deserve anything less but life in prison with no eligibility for parole. And that's something that is still hurting us because he's still going to be eligible to come out eventually. That's a really sad irony because Kane Moore is the exact type of young man Ricardo Hebe would have wanted to help. So you can't help but wonder if things could have gone differently. That didn't need to end up like that. I accepted that there's nothing I could have changed. There's nothing that anybody could have done. It wasn't even supposed to be for him. This shouldn't even happen. He was taken from me. Not having him around, I am very, very lost still. <laughs> Despite the pain they live with every day, Ricardo's loved ones try to stay strong and keep Ricardo's memory alive, especially for his son, Junior. Everybody dealt with it in their own way. I still have a good relationship with his son. I'm godfather to his son. I've made him a promise when he was alive, and I'm just fulfilling that promise to look after his son. I want people to know that his heart was there. He wanted the best for these kids. It's just everyone knows his legacy was left. And his smile and just how genuine he is. And that's why I want to keep going. Our son has love for hockey. So he's an all-star now. Ready, he wants to play the Jets, he says. I said, do it. Your dad would be proud. He would watch you. He's a little hockey star now. But now I'm a hockey mom, so I got this. Did it for him and his dad. supposed to go out to eat. So she goes, let's do it after New Year's because we don't want to be outside with these clowns when they're acting up during New Year's. We can see this person go to Jamie's apartment and then is seen again exiting his sweatshirt with blood soaked. It looked like a pretty brutal fight had taken place in that bedroom. How could this have happened? They didn't have any answers for me. We thought it was unlikely that it was a random act of violence. We pull up Jamie's Facebook and see if she's friends with this guy. And she was. We wonder what his mindset is, what's he capable of. Year's Eve 2016, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 28-year-old Jamie Wounded Arrow is looking forward to an exciting new year. 
She's got a new home and big plans. She had gotten her own apartment. She had gotten this job, and she loved it. She was proud of the fact that she did all of this stuff on her own. It kind of gave her that confidence, like, I can do this. Now I wonder how much more I can do. Born on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and a member of the Oglala Lakota tribe, Jamie is the youngest of eight children. When Jamie was born, there was a lot of us in the family always trying to hold Jamie, always trying to be with Jamie. She was a complete mama's girl. She loved her mom. That bond that Jamie and my mom had together was unbreakable. Jamie has always been proud of her Native American heritage, and it is a central part of her identity. Being Oglala Lakota was like everything for her. There was like a sense of freedom, and I saw that from her. And there's another part of Jamie's identity that she's proud of. Though her assigned sex at birth was male, she has always identified as female. Jamie started to know that she was transgender and never hid that from day one. Especially how she would dress, the makeup, the way she carried herself, and into the schools, none of that was hidden. My mom would help Jamie, and they would get through things together. My mom was always there for, for Jamie. In some Native American cultures, the term used to describe a transgender person is two-spirited. It's pretty much used everywhere now as the Native American community. If you're LGBT, this is what you are. It's just something that we're born with. This is how we walk. We walk both worlds. While Jamie was accepted by her own family, others on the reservation weren't as open-minded. Jamie had a heavy weight on her due to being transgender. The negativity that was going around and what Jamie had to go against. She used to tell us stories about how she was picked on and she really didn't seem like she could be herself. In high school, the emotional toll drives Jamie to drug and alcohol abuse. There were some struggles that Jamie had, and those are the things that I think Jamie used as a coping mechanism for that. But as time went on, Jamie started to find herself in a positive way. When Jamie is 26, she decides to leave the reservation in search of a more supportive community and to start working on her sobriety. She moves to Sioux Falls and soon connects with a support group for the indigenous LGBT community. We were running the Sioux Falls Two-Spirit and Allies Society. So she walked over and she goes, are you guys Two-Spirit? And we were like, yeah. And. We just kind of sat and visited like we already knew each other. It seemed like she felt free. She could actually be herself. She got on the track of, you know, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sober up. Then she went to treatment. She got, she got better. She would contact me for support in her sobriety just because I knew her struggle and I was sober. It was more like a big sister, little sister thing of just watching out for each other. Now in 2016, 
Jamie has hit the two-year mark of sobriety and feels she is finally in control of her future. She lands her dream job as a telemarketer, where she gets to connect with people from all walks of life. She had gotten this job that she was five-star call center here. She loved it. And she actually sat and told me, she goes, sister, I feel like I'm good. I finally feel like I'm good now in a good place. On New Year's Eve 2016, Jamie opts for a quiet night at home after picking up some takeout. Jamie and I spoke over the phone. We were supposed to go out to eat. So she goes, all right, well, let's do it after New Year's because we don't want to be outside with these clowns when they're acting up during New Year's. So, and I said, okay, yeah, we'll do it. At 8.30 p.m., she settles in for the evening. Jamie had posted a um, meme of Marge Simpson laid out in a bed, obviously sleeping. And Jamie posted it in a joking kind of way, indicating that although she knew most of her friends would be out partying that night, she had no intention of doing so. And Jamie's sending out some text messages to family and friends that said, Happy New Year. Her loved ones don't know it is the final time they will ever hear from her. As the new year begins, Jamie grows uncharacteristically quiet. No calls, no emails, no texts, no online posts. When Jamie initially stopped communicating using her cell phone, her friends didn't reach out to law enforcement initially perhaps out of a desire to give their friends some privacy. On January 6th, Sioux Falls police respond to a call for a wellness check at an apartment near the city center. The apartment manager called law enforcement after she had received some type of complaint from a tenant. I was at home in bed, got a call. A young lady was walking down the hallway, and she could smell something. When patrol officers arrive, they knock on the door of the apartment that seems to be the source of the odor. The landlord provides them with the tenant's name, Jamie Wounded Arrow. There's no answer, so they force their way in. Nothing seemed to be in disarray in either the living room or the kitchen, but that was a different story once you entered the bedroom. You immediately noticed blood all over the walls, on the ceilings. There were smear marks. The bedding was all over the place and full of blood. The floor was full of blood. It looked like a pretty brutal fight had taken place in that bedroom. Given the condition of the scene, the patrol officers call in the homicide squad. Detectives quickly arrive and continue searching through the apartment. The closet doors were the type that slide back and forth and they had been broken off with the hinges. And the closet was Jamie. On her back, she'd been secreted in that closet. Her shirt was pulled up, and I could see what appeared to me to be stab wounds to her chest. Jamie's body's obviously in a state of decomposition. What's going through my head is that we are way behind. Everyone talks about the first 48. We're way beyond that. We're way past four or five days. We have homicides that are pretty much cut and dry, but it was apparent to me that this would be a whodunit. Investigators follow a dark trail of clues left by a killer. The knife was found in the bedroom. There was blood on it. Our coroner had no problem saying that he believed that that was the murder weapon. When you're looking at video and you see someone enter and when he exits, he's blood soaked, you start to key in on that. And find themselves in a race against the clock. Anytime you have, especially a homicide suspect who's on the run, who's also on the run from parole, 
you still wonder what his mindset is. Is this an isolated incident? What's he capable of? Sioux Falls police have discovered the body of Jamie Wounded Arrow, stabbed to death in a closet in her apartment. They believe she has been dead for several days. The body is speaking to you, and it's saying a lot. I had some questions in regards to how Jamie's shirt was when she was stabbed. We pulled her shirt back down, and we could match the stab wounds on her chest to the rips in the fabric. So that helps to tell the story that her shirt was down when she was attacked. I believe he just attempted to secret her in the closet. When he pulls her by the shirt to get her in the closet, the shirt comes up around her neck. As they wait for the coroner to arrive, detectives turn to the rest of Jamie's apartment, searching for any clues. So in this crime scene, you're looking for things that are there and more importantly, things that aren't there. Her phone isn't there. There's no purse there. It's apparent that somebody has left with these things. Although these items are missing, detectives don't see any signs of a break-in. As they continue to scour her apartment, they discover what they believe could be the murder weapon. The knife was found in the bedroom, there was blood on it. Jamie's body sustained seven stab wounds, all of which were consistent with a three and a half to four inch blade of a kitchen knife. That knife was bagged, sent into the lab for forensic testing. Our coroner had no problem saying that he believed that that was the murder weapon. With a killer on the loose, Investigators know they must move quickly. Jamie's phone was missing. Obviously, that becomes a major focus with some of the investigators that I've tasked to, to find her phone. So there are subpoenas being written, search warrants, everything we can do possible to find the phone. The other huge thing in today's day and age is video. Jamie's apartment complex had surveillance cameras stationed at various locations on the property near the entrances and exits to the buildings themselves. You're literally praying that these cameras are functional. So there's phone calls being made to management to have them save and preserve all that videotape. While they wait to get the video, detectives are faced with the difficult task of contacting Jamie's family. When I had gotten that call, I just asked why. Why has this happened? And how could this have happened? They didn't have any answers for me. Then I let my mom know. And that was hard to relay that information to her because she had dementia. It brought tears to our eyes because it was devastating. It was unreal. It was heartbreaking. When I got the news, it was a big shock, a, a huge shock for us. How did this happen? News of the murder of a Native American transgender woman brutally stabbed in her own home quickly spreads. It's unusual. It is still headline news when a murder happens in Sioux Falls. So the fact that it happened on New Year's Eve to a member of the trans community was a really big deal. They wanted to make sure a killer was brought to justice. In search of answers, Detectives begin questioning Jamie's neighbors. It was a huge apartment complex. I'd say probably a thousand people living there. It seemed to be a place where people kept to themselves. 
people minded their own business. And so it wouldn't be unusual for a tenant to not be seen by his or her neighbors for a number of days. But you can't discount someone in the building having knowledge and potentially being involved. So we talked to all of them just to find if they were witnesses. And the canvas ended up revealing really nothing. Nobody heard anything. Detectives also look for clues in Jamie's cell phone records and activity on social media. It ends with her post at 11.08 p.m. on New Year's Eve. There was nothing there. This is the last communication she has. There is no usage of her phone, no private messages or DMs. Meanwhile, investigators get the answer they are hoping for regarding the apartment complex's security cameras. They were working, and the video is available. Detectives immediately retrieve the video, and they start to pick it apart. It's a situation where you're waiting with bated breath to see, is our perpetrator going to show himself to us? Falls detectives are pouring through security footage from Jamie Wounded Arrow's apartment complex frame by frame, hoping to find clues about what happened in her final moments. You have to watch every second of it because you don't know what's going to be missed. The video shows Jamie arriving home at 8.30 p.m. on New Year's Eve. The investigators don't see anything unusual in the footage after that, until several hours later. We had surveillance footage that showed a person arriving to her apartment complex at around 3.30 in the morning. About two minutes after that, you see him walk back and out the apartment complex. About a minute or two later, he reappears and comes back to the entry of the apartment complex walks down the stairs to what is Jamie's apartment, and then is seen again an hour and 10 minutes later exiting the apartment complex. Investigators believe they are looking at Jamie's killer. He is the only person seen on surveillance during the window of time in which Jamie was murdered. It was like hitting a jackpot. You, you can't believe how lucky you are, how lucky that the cameras were recording, that the footage was still there, that it captured our suspect. But the video doesn't give the investigators a clear look at the man's face. Still, what they see leads them to believe this is possibly someone who Jamie knows. The suspect knocked on the door for a significant amount of time, received no response. He walked out, walked around the apartment complex, banged on her window, woke her up. He came back in, and she let him in the house. It's highly unlikely that he's a stranger. When he arrived to Jamie's apartment, he was wearing basketball, shorts, sneakers, and a sweatshirt. His appearance changed when he came out of Jamie's apartment sometime after 4.40 in the morning. What they see next convinces detectives they are indeed looking at Jamie's killer. And you could read that this was a, a sweatshirt that said Peabody Energy on it. And it appeared to me that the sweatshirt was bloody. Uh, I'd go so far as to say blood soaked. But when you're looking at video and you see someone enter and when he exits, he's blood soaked, you start to key in on that. Then we see him walk over to a hill with kind of a, a grove of trees, and he starts throwing things uh, into this little ravine, and then he disappears from view. 
officers rush to the ravine behind the apartment complex and begin searching the area. We found Jamie's clutch purse with Jamie's ID and social security card in it and a debit card. There was no money in it. We don't know if he had taken money out of it, but he certainly had not taken the debit card out of it. As they investigate, detectives also ponder potential motives for the vicious attack. In my mind, there was some motive besides robbery. We thought it was unlikely that it was a random act of violence, given that we had seen the perpetrator's behavior on the surveillance footage. And he, he appeared to know his victim. Investigators wondered whether Jamie's status as a trans female was a motive here. It certainly could have been, so we had to look at it as if it was potentially a hate crime. I remember on the news they kept saying, she's now the second or third transgender woman in the United States to be killed on New Year's. It was, it was a shock. Searching for any evidence to support that possibility or point to a different motive for this murder, detectives begin a deep dive into Jamie's background. They quickly uncover some troubling information about her past. She battled addiction. She had had some run-ins with the criminal justice system. So she had a lot of struggles. She was battling through them and doing the best that she could. The investigators learned that Jamie's struggles included a conviction for drug possession. As a result, the court had ordered her into a treatment program. She had been to the Arch, which is a halfway house in Sioux Falls. A halfway house means you're coming out of incarceration and they're trying to blend you back into society. There's AA meetings, there's any number of things that are geared to get a person who's in that system back out into society. But I knew from our investigation that while she was at the Arch, she came into contact with many felons. We know that sometimes people who are in treatment use the connections they make at those facilities for good, as we believe Jamie did. We also know people often use those connections for bad. There were a number of red flags raised. Homicide detectives wonder if someone Jamie Wounded Era met during her stay at a halfway house might have been involved in her murder. Looking for any connection, they examine the data from Jamie's missing cell phone, and they find something unexpected. We learned that two calls had been placed after the time the likely perpetrator had left Jamie's apartment. She had already been killed. So we knew it wasn't her using the phone. It had to be the killer. Law enforcement was able to determine that the first call was in this dial. We could see through the records, we got a hold of this gentleman who had nothing to do with the case. After the wrong number, the records show the second call from Jamie's phone came at around 5 a.m. on New Year's Day to a woman named Brianna White Butterfly. She told investigators the call had been placed to her from her boyfriend. She identified him by name, Joshua LeClaire. She indicated to law enforcement that she had been with him earlier in the night on, on New Year's Eve and that he'd left at some point that night. They had argued he was drunk and he had left the house and he did not have a phone. And she was wondering whose phone he was using to call her in the early morning hours. We learned Joshua LeClaire is a Native American man who was raised on the Pine Ridge Reservation and in Rapid City, South Dakota. He also had a conviction for first-degree burglary from 2011. He was sent to prison for that. He was released on parole in 2016 but absconded, meaning he, he 
disappeared, ceased communications with his parole officer, and had a warrant out for his arrest at the time Jamie died. Joshua LeClaire is now the prime suspect in Jamie's murder. And as detectives dig further into his past, they find a clear connection between him and Jamie. Joshua and Jamie knew each other. We know they had contact together at the Arch in Sioux Falls when both of them were going through treatment. There was obviously a connection there. So we pull up Jamie's Facebook and see if she's friends with this guy. And she was. We know that they had some communications, though we're not sure of the extent of their relationship and, and what it all entailed. Investigators hope Jamie's family can fill in some blanks about the relationship. It started out as far as Jamie helping with money, with $20 here and $20 here, and I don't know if there was a relationship there or what, but it had started because he was there also at the Arch. While Joshua LeClaire does seem to resemble the man in the security video, the footage is grainy, and detectives have no physical evidence linking him to the murder or a motive for him to have killed someone who appears to be a friend. There was no evidence to show that Josh held any ill will towards her. But none of this makes sense. The investigators are ready to confront Joshua to see if he can clear things up. We immediately put out what we call a bolo, or be on the lookout for Josh. As they search for him, detectives also track down his friends and press them for leads on his whereabouts. Law enforcement started with Joshua's immediate circle, his girlfriend, friends who knew him, perhaps friends who had spent time with him in the days leading up to Jamie's murder. That led them to one of Joshua's friends who had spent time with him on New Year's Eve. The friend, Roscoe Poorbear, has an unexpected and stunning story to tell. Roscoe Poorbear told law enforcement he had, in fact, been with Joshua on the early morning hours of New Year's Day. Roscoe noticed that Joshua was wearing a bloody sweatshirt and saw Joshua throw the sweatshirt into a dumpster at a construction site. They were able to go to the construction site and they found the sweatshirt just where Roscoe said it would be. The bloody sweatshirt appears to be the same one worn by the man in the surveillance video from Jamie's apartment complex. To be able to see the logo of that sweatshirt on the camera, to find that sweatshirt in a dumpster when a witness had said, this is where Josh LeClaire threw this sweatshirt. That was a very important part of the case to see that. As they send the sweatshirt to the forensics lab for testing, police also send the search for Joshua LeClaire into high gear. At this point, efforts to locate Joshua are ramping up significantly with statewide law enforcement to check all corners of the state for locations Joshua may possibly be. The concern was, has he fled? Anytime you have, especially a homicide suspect who's on the run, who's also on the run from parole, you still wonder what his mindset is. Is this an isolated incident? What's he capable of? A search is underway in South Dakota for Joshua LeClaire, the prime suspect in the murder of Jamie Wounded Arrow. He's been on the run for two days, and investigators have no leads to where he could be hiding. Until Sioux Falls police respond to a routine call for help. 
Local law enforcement were called to a report of an intoxicated person. They thought this was a call of a drunken, disorderly person who needed to go to detox. Police show up, and initially they don't know who they're speaking to because the man gives them a false name. He lied about who he was. Patrol officers didn't know going in that they were dealing with Josh LeClaire. But once the officers arrest him for creating a public disturbance, they discover his true identity. Homicide detectives rush to the station to interrogate him about Jamie's murder. When Detective Baki got Joshua into the interview room, he was intoxicated. And Detective Baki knew that he had to buy himself some time. He offered Joshua coffee, offered him cigarettes in an effort to help him sober up. As soon as the detective sits down with his suspect, something catches his eye. Joshua had a significant laceration on his palm. We knew, based on the nature of Jamie's wounds, that the kitchen knife was the, was the murder weapon. And Joshua LeClaire's injury was consistent with using a knife to stab another person. Detective Baki smartly didn't mention it for a number of hours. It was there, he saw it, and he waited for the right opportunity to talk to Joshua about it. You come and confront him, there's going to be an immediate denial. It's human nature, and it's getting by that denial. It's working around that denial and getting to the truth. That's what takes time. He did never deny knowing Jamie. He didn't deny going to her apartment. He simply used the excuse that he was blackout drunk and could only remember bits and pieces of why he was there and what had happened during the interaction. But Detective Baki continues to press him harder and harder. We started to broach the fact that he was in the apartment and there was a fight. Joshua said that he and Jamie had argued over a pair of shoes. But Joshua's excuse didn't make sense. The brutality of her murder was not consistent uh, with an argument over shoes. As I began to press a bit, Josh eventually did say that he got the cut on his hand from stabbing Jamie. This was a confession. This meant, on top of all of the other evidence we had to that point, we had an admission, he is the killer. The evidence in this case, it was stacked. We had surveillance footage showing Joshua LeClaire had been to Jamie's apartment. We saw him on video throwing items of Jamie's into the ravine. We knew he had an injury to his hand, which could only have been caused by stabbing someone repeatedly and the knife sliding up his palm. We knew from Roscoe Poorbear that Joshua had the same sweatshirt we saw him wearing at Jamie's apartment. Only when Roscoe saw it, it was bloody. And when the lab results come in, they show the blood on the sweatshirt matches both Joshua LeClaire and Jamie Wounded Arrow. All of that, along with Joshua's confession, left no doubt in anyone's mind that he was the killer. We don't know if Joshua panicked after he killed Jamie. He did some things which seemed counterintuitive. He left the knife, he took her IDs, but left his blood. To a casual observer, someone who watches crime show TVs, they would question, why would the suspect do that? Well, the biggest factor, in my opinion, is that this person's never killed before. It doesn't make sense because it can't make sense. What we do know is that he did enough in his mind to try to avoid getting caught. On 
On January 8, 2017, Sioux Falls police charged Joshua LeClaire with first-degree murder for the stabbing death of Jamie Wounded Arrow. But even after a long interrogation, investigators still don't know his motive or what happened to Jamie in her final moments. In regards to the transgender portion of this case and potential hate crime, it simply wasn't there. In my opinion, the brutality of the crime certainly indicated that Joshua knew Jamie and that he was motivated by some sense of hatred, even if not necessarily based on her status as a trans woman. We don't know if he made advances toward her that were rejected or a drunken fight of some sort, an argument. Just the viciousness of the attack signaled to me that there was something deeper beyond just a casual acquaintanceship. Faced with the overwhelming evidence against him, Joshua LeClaire pleads guilty. But before the court can hold a sentencing hearing, the confessed killer drops a bombshell. At his pre-sentencing interview, Joshua LeClaire gave information that changed everything. Joshua LeClaire has pleaded guilty to stabbing Jamie Wounded Arrow to death in her Sioux Falls apartment. He's never said why he did it. But before he can be sentenced, he makes a stunning claim. He told the investigator that there had been a sexual advance made towards him and Jamie had grabbed a knife and he had defended himself. At first, he said there was an argument over shoes. It wasn't until his sentencing was looming that he said Jamie had made a sexual advance toward him, that he felt threatened by it, and he stabbed her in self-defense. It was offensive, frankly, to have Joshua um, try to shame Jamie in this way. There were no indications that she had made any advances toward him. I don't believe it to be true in any way, shape, or form. I believe that's a person who's at the end of the road and is about to be sentenced, is going to say anything. The only person here who had defensive wounds to her hands and her forearms was Jamie. Whereas Joshua had none of that. The only wound Joshua had was the injury to his palm, which was as a direct result of stabbing Jamie so many times. At this point, we felt Joshua LeClaire was kind of like an animal backed into a corner. It's not unusual for defendants to shame the victim before sentencing. At the same time, we had to wonder whether the sentencing judge would consider it as true. The answer comes on June 26, 2018, when Joshua LeClaire appears in court for his sentencing hearing. Joshua asked for a lenient sentence, but he spoke about Jamie in the abstract as if he didn't know her. He said something to the effect of, no one deserves to be killed this way. When he was the one who did it, it showed a remarkable sense of selfishness and a lack of true remorse. I just remember being there and I remember seeing him and I just kind of looked over like this and I remember it was like it was real when it's somebody that you love it's anger it's sadness it's a lot of emotions and in my statement there I did mention that he should rot in prison, too. The judge rejects the claim of self-defense and sentences 27-year-old Joshua LeClaire to 65 years in prison. Making him an old man by the time he gets out. 
It is, for all intents and purposes, a life sentence for him. This individual that took our sister's life, our baby sister's life. He got, you know, what was given to him. So that was a tough thing to do, to be sitting in front of that, um, that male who did that. It, I think I cried for, oh, I felt like forever. For Jamie's loved ones, the outcome is bittersweet. They were overjoyed that justice had been done in spite of what had been done to Jamie. But there was a sense of dissatisfaction in that Joshua never really told the whole story. And we'll probably never know the real reason he was there and what happened between them. I really miss seeing how happy she was when she started accomplishing some of her goals. Sense of uh, happiness. Yes, I did it. There's a lot of what ifs with Jamie's life being cut short and my mom having dementia. It wasn't just that one time that I had to break the story to her. It was every time that I went to go visit her. I would have to tell her each time that it was Jamie that was gone. And each time that brought tears to her eyes and we had to relive it. People who go through this, you have to have strength within yourself to continue on to live your life also, to live for them. I know that if he was my boyfriend and was in love with me, I know he would be amazing. I cannot wait to see him. I texted asking if she was okay, and she never texted back. I asked her friends, acquaintances, anybody, if you have seen her, contact me. By 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm in full mode panic. And then I told her, we need to go to Grand Rapids. It was like time stood still. We knew something was wrong. That's when I see blood. I'd yell at my girlfriend. Call the cops. Call the cops. I opened the bag, and there were human limbs inside that bag. I remember thinking, what kind of animal does this to a person? Autumn 2018, Kalamazoo, Michigan. 31-year-old Ashley Young is pursuing her dream of becoming a language interpreter. Ashley wanted to explore. She wanted to learn any culture. It didn't matter who you were, you know. She was going to ask you questions and ask how your day was. So let's talk about my morning and how amazing, and I promise this is none of this is exaggerated or made up. It is, you can't make this up, okay? I always told her, you can do anything, you can be anything that you want. You just need to put your mind to it. To make ends meet, Ashley works nights at a bank call center. She loved that job. 
she was helping people with their accounts if they had questions and she could put their mind to ease. During the day, Ashley takes language classes at Kalamazoo Community College. So anyways, have a good day. I really am gonna go get ready for class now and sorry for talking a lot, but that's just me. Ashley was positive, always positive. We called her uh, sunshine. Today was a sucky day, but at the same time, it makes me laugh so hard. Ashley was always on social media. She was the light, the conscience you would never knew you really needed. And the times that you were frustrated, she put it in perspective for you. Like, you know, you could have it worse. I uh, hope I at least made you smile and made you realize that, you know, your day is probably going a hell of a lot better than mine. I met Christine um, in 2002. Ashley and her mom were best buddies, and I had to be that step parent. But we made it, you know. Ashley was just lovable and joyful. I met Ashley the first day of 10th grade. We had a couple classes together, we had choir together. We'd sit in our car for hours just talking in her mom's driveway, listening to music, singing, and just being, being silly girls. And then after school, we, you know, we're still inseparable. After high school, Ashley puts her dreams of studying languages on hold. She works a series of jobs, and when she is 24 years old, she meets Moody Farhan. The two quickly fall in love, and within a couple of years, are living together. She had never really dated or been with anyone until Moody, and he was her first love. She adored him, and he adored her, and it was just like a little fairy tale. Moody loved her, and he had already, like, gave her a promise ring. They were together almost seven years. But by 31, Ashley has decided to make big changes in her life. Not only is she in school working towards her dream job, but she also decides that it's time to end her long-time relationship. She was trying to balance work and going to school, and they were both kind of just at a different point in their life. After the breakup, on November 10th, 2018, she surprises her best friend, Samantha, with a trip to Detroit. She took me to Detroit to go to a concert to go see Tosh Sultana, an artist that I love. That trip was amazing. <laughs> this is Facebook Live, by the way. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> ah, oh, you look so pretty. After our concert, we just talked about life, you know, just talked about where we were both at at that time, about her and Moody and about how she was going to be moving out. She was nervous, but it gave her something to look forward to. When she brought me home, I didn't know that that was going to be the last time I ever saw her. A week later, on November 18th, Ashley meets her mom, Christine, to begin packing up her things from the home she shares with Moody. Her and Moody are moving out of their apartment, so we put everything into storage for her. Ashley asks her mom to come with her at the end of the month when she'll sign the lease on a new apartment. Ashley was beyond ecstatic about getting this apartment. Talking to her, you would have thought she was winning a million dollars. You would have thought she was decorating a mansion the way she would talk. And that was the last time I saw Ashley. On Wednesday, November 28th, the night before Ashley is scheduled to sign her lease, she goes out for the evening. Ashley checks in with her mom, but does not say where she is headed or who she is meeting. 
The last time I got a message from Ashley was at 5.55. And she said that she was almost to her destination. That's not Ashley. Ashley would say, you know. I'm at Walmart. Or... Yeah, wherever she was, mm-hmm. but she said destination. The morning of the lease signing comes, and Christine does not hear from Ashley. I sent her a message first thing in the morning. I'm like, where are you? Where are you? And all day. I'm not getting anything. It, it, there was something wrong. I called Ashley's work, but nobody has heard from her. And that's when it starts hitting me. Where is she? And it just snowballs from there. You're not answering. I am worried. You don't tell people where you are going. You don't, you don't have to tell me, but damn it, you need to tell someone. I need to know you're okay. You need to contact someone and let somebody know. November 30th, in the morning, I called the police to file a missing persons report. Officers talked to some people that were close to Ashley to see if they knew where she was or or could account for her whereabouts, and they could not. When we get a missing person report, and the person happens to be 31 years old, that that could mean a number of things. Maybe the person doesn't want to be found or is just away with friends and and having a good time. So it's generally not assigned to a full-blown investigation at that point. But Ashley's loved ones have a sinking feeling something is wrong, and they know that this is all happening in the wake of a big breakup. When she broke up with Moody... I think, you know, Moody didn't really want it. When somebody goes missing, especially young women, a partner or a potential partner, somebody that they know and that they trust or that they're potentially intimate with, tends to be the person that might harm them. As the day goes on and you're not hearing anything, panic starts to set in. So I called Moody and I asked him, where is she? Investigators catch a glimpse of Ashley's final moments. You can see him kind of turn around. He's pointing at something. He's talking to somebody. And then eventually Ashley joins him. And race to determine who she was with. He seemed to be a person prone to violence and unpredictable. Before the unthinkable happens. I tell the dispatcher, I need officers fast. I see a lot of death. This one stands out in my career as a horrific scene. November 30th, 2018. 31-year-old Ashley Young has not contacted her family in more than 24 hours. At midnight, I'm flipping out a little bit. By 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm in full mode panic. And I remember I called my supervisor. And I said, I'm not going to be in today. And she said, okay, is there anything I can do? The first words out of my mouth were pray. Just needed to pray. Ashley's family is worried her disappearance might have something to do with her recent breakup with her boyfriend, Moody. Prior to them actually breaking up, Ashley told me there had been a couple arguments and their relationship did hit a couple walls. But Moody appears genuinely distraught about Ashley's disappearance. 
he starts panicking because he don't know where Ashley is, and that's why he got with us in the middle of the night. Mooney was right there with us looking for her, and he was so hurt and so upset. Moody loved her, and I knew she loved him, too. When Moody provides police with information about his whereabouts for the past several days, he is cleared by law enforcement. Christine makes a plea to Ashley's friends. I put out on Facebook that I haven't heard from her, can't get in contact with her. I asked her friends, acquaintances, anybody, if you have seen her, contact me. Meanwhile, Christine uncovers a possible lead on Facebook. Christine goes into her daughter's Facebook activity and is able to see that she's been communicating with a person named Jared Chance in recent days. Jared Chance is an old friend of Ashley's. Six years ago, they spent a lot of time together hanging out as friends. There might have been an attraction there, you know, but Ashley was not that type because she was in that relationship with Moody. And then Jared disappeared. So she never heard from him in six years. During our trip to Detroit to go to the concert, she had said that he was really reaching out. They started talking more and more, and then Jared called her because he needed a ride home. And so she went and helped him. And so then he wanted to take her out as a thank you. In the wake of her breakup with Moody, Ashley has just begun to dip her toes into the dating pool. She was texting me about having feelings for Jared, just asking for advice on what do you think I should say? Should I say this or should I say that? And yeah, I just want to get it perfect. Ashley leaves another friend a voicemail expressing her excitement about Jared. Jared is so hard to read, but I know that if he was my boyfriend and he actually like, was in love with me, I know he would be amazing. I cannot wait to see him on Wednesday. Wednesday, November 28th, the night Ashley vanished. Once I found out that Ashley was with Jared, I asked if anybody had his phone number. One of Ashley's friends does. So Christine calls Jared to see if he can help. She asks him, do you know where my daughter is? Do you have any information? And he said that they were actually together the previous night, but that she went home and that he has no idea what happened to her. Jared said that Ashley and him had been to Mulligan's Bar in East Town, Grand Rapids. And then I told Christine, we need to go to Grand Rapids. We need to go see where she was. Follow her footsteps. Grand Rapids is about an hour north of Kalamazoo, where Ashley lives. Grand Rapids is a college town. It's a huge city. It's the second largest city in the state of Michigan. Ashley's moms arrive at Mulligan's on November 30th. So I talked with the bartender at Mulligan's, and we were able to go look at the security footage. You could see Jared and Ashley wandering around the bar. She ordered a drink. She's smiling. She's laughing. She's being Ashley. I wanted to pull her off the screen and take her home. But the footage doesn't show her leaving the bar. Despair and desperation start sinking in for Ashley's loved ones. It was like time stood still. You know, in a sense, and you just had that, that pit in your stomach. We knew something was wrong. And we just went, driving around Grand Rapids, looking for Ashley. We walked down the railroad tracks. We poked around ponds, lakes. There was nothing. It's almost like you think you're dreaming, but you're not dreaming. Everything was a wild goose chase.
Friday, November 30th, 2018. Christine Young has had no luck finding her missing daughter, Ashley. But she has discovered that Ashley was last seen at a bar with a friend named Jared Chance on the night she disappeared. She takes what she's learned to the Grand Rapids police. Christine Young asked for the, the police department to help, but if it was Jared, we need we need evidence, you know. You can develop theories, but theories won't get you a search warrant. Theories won't get you an arrest warrant. You need you need evidence, you need facts. Frustrated, Christine reaches out again to Jared. He previously told her that he and Ashley went their separate ways after going to the bar on November 28th. She begs him to share anything else he can remember. And that's when he told me about Demetrius. Jared says Ashley was talking to a guy he knows named Demetrius Taylor that night at the bar. The relentless mothers track him down. When we got there, he's like, I don't know, Ashley. I don't know your daughter at all. And he opened up his phone and showed the text messages where Jared said, hey, Ashley's mom's going to call you, and you have to say that Ashley was just with you, and you guys were just together. And Christine was reading it, and she's like, No. Demetrius said, you can copy it, give it to the police, whatever you need to do. Even though we didn't know him, we kind of hit it off. And because he was compassionate and was understanding what Christine was going through. And he said, he has kids. He understands. After that point, I think everybody kind of knew that we just didn't get the whole story from Jared. It just became more and more plain that Jared was trying to stall. I had always told her that I didn't think that he was good for her. I didn't think that he necessarily had the best intentions for her or that he knew how to be a good man. Christine and Dana decide to head to Jared's apartment to confront him face to face. That same afternoon, a resident of downtown Grand Rapids makes a shocking discovery. I was living in Grand Rapids on Franklin Street. Two apartments downstairs, single father, custody of my 12-year-old daughter. My girlfriend had been complaining about a bad smell in the apartment for, you know, about a day and a half. And me, I'm thinking, there's dead mice in the walls or something. But the smell was definitely strong. My cat runs in the basement. So I had to go to retrieve my cat. So I opened the door so the light from the day could shine down into the basement so I could see. As I go down the stairs, I see the tarp on the floor. That's when I see blood. I make it to the top of the stairs at full speed. I yell at my girlfriend, call the cops, call the cops. I'm not the smartest man in the world, but there's blood, there's trouble. I'm thinking I'm a father, like I have a daughter at home. Like, I need officers fast. Please, somebody right now, because I don't, I don't know what it is, but it looks like blood, and we can find it. And I'm not going to touch the type or anything like that. 
GRPD showed up at that address not too long afterwards. Like most police agencies, you know, they all have body cameras on now. And so we're able to watch the officers go into the basement. And it's it's like watching a horror movie because they're going through this darkened basement that's lit by flashlights. They look at the tarp and see something that they will never ever forget. On December 2nd, 2018, Grand Rapids police officers make a horrific discovery in the basement of an apartment building. I'm standing in the driveway like, oh, shit. this can't be, you know what I'm saying? Like, this, this is not real, this is not real, this is not, this is not happening. The police asked me, can they search my house? Of course, sir, like, please. Among the officers who respond is the detective who Christine has asked for help in her search for Ashley. By the time I got there, there were uh, officers in front and back of the house making sure that nobody um, went in or, or came out without us knowing it. Okay, the tarp is laying on stairs, about the last three stairs. I then entered the house, went down into the basement where this tarp was found. So this tarp was quite large and it had a zipper on it. I unzipped the bag and we then discovered the body of a woman with uh, the arms and legs and head missing. I remember thinking, who are we dealing with here? You know, what kind of animal does this to a person? Police have now discovered this horrendous scene and they know that they have a body but all of the identifying features have been removed so they don't know who is dead and they don't know who potentially killed them there's multiple occupants in this multi-dwelling residence Wait for the car Come to the door. who do you think they found living in the upstairs apartment Jared was secured in a police car and transported to our headquarters. It didn't take long to realize that this, this case was going to be different than most. I see a lot of death all methods and this one it stands out in my career as, as as a horrific scene I went up the stairs looking for the rest of the body when I entered the second level apartment there was a large brown stain on the kitchen floor I look in the bathroom and noted there wasn't a shower curtain in the bathtub I remember looking at one of the floor vents and I pulled the grate off and then I saw cartridges, small caliber, a lot of different areas that we found tested positive for blood. Clearly something bad happened and somebody tried to cover it up. As we made our way out of the apartment, back to the stairwell, we found a box about midway on the landing. So I start to open the box and I see a black trash bag. 
I opened the bag and there were human limbs inside that bag. There are two legs and there are two arms and there are no hands and there are no feet. At that very moment, Ashley's family is headed to Jared's to confront him for sending them on a wild goose chase with Demetrius Taylor. They have no idea that it is now a crime scene. We pulled up at 6 o'clock and the yellow tape was around Jared's house. I was screaming at the officer that was stopping us from going any further. And I'm telling him, my stepdaughter's up there. My stepdaughter was with Jared. And he said, ma'am, I can't tell you anything. And I said, well, her mom's right over there. And he, the only thing he could say is go tell mom not to leave. And I'm like, no, it can't be. It, it's not Ashley. It's not. I didn't want to believe it. The police explained that they were doing DNA because it was that bad. They couldn't recognize her. Without the confirmation from DNA, we certainly couldn't say these remains belong to Ashley. But it was pretty clear to everybody involved that uh, the remains were very likely to be, unfortunately, Ashley's. I just have to prove it. Police now have the one person who can explain the gruesome scene in their custody. So Jared was kept in our county jail, but the investigation doesn't stop. We found two spent 22 casings in the apartment, which led me to believe that this was a shooting. We'd also found out that Jared Chance did have a 22 caliber pistol that was now missing. So at this point, we have a, a body found in Jared Chance's house. At the same time, we have Jared Chance present in the house. We certainly would like to, to hear from Jared what happened. Grand Rapids police have discovered female remains in the building where Jared Chance lives. They need Jared to tell them if this is Ashley Young. Jared Chance was taken into custody and transported to our headquarters. So I asked Detective Fan and Detective Bray to attempt an interview with them. Can you hang tight just for a sec? We'll get your cuffs up, okay? All right. Want me to take them off the cuffs? Or... Uh, yeah, you're going to be decent with us? Yeah. All right. Initially, Jared was somewhat talkative. Can you guys stay busy, don't you? Huh? You stay busy, don't you? Pretty much. He was rude. Almost seemed like it was just another day. Didn't really ask why he was there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jared. Uh, okay, I just recommend me to just ask for the advice of attorney because I don't really know what the hell's going on. So mm -hmm. I don't want to like sit here and talk about shit that may, may incriminate me or whatever in any kind of way because I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want to say nothing right now. He exercised his right to counsel at that point and, and didn't tell us anything. So on the evening of December 2nd, Jared is charged with the mutilation of a body and concealing a crime. Our next step in our investigation is to utilize you know, every avenue we have for a timeline. We had phone records placing them together, 28th into the 29th, and then seems... The activity stopped, and her, her phone, um, in essence, just disappeared. But Ashley had been seen at a pub with Jared Chance here in the city. By the time we found out that they were at Mulligan's, that video is gone. You know, local businesses don't keep all their video forever. But because of Christine's doggedness, she had already seen the video. Hoping for additional evidence to solidify the case against Jared, investigators comb through more footage from businesses near Mulligan's. 
So we did obtain video from a local business called the PETA House. And it's dated November 29th, and it's approximately 1.30 in the morning. It shows Jared walking in front of the, the business. There he goes right now, just kind of strolling along. And then, you know, a few seconds later, that's Ashley there. And once again, we see Jared walk into screen and then eventually Ashley joins him. We know clearly from the video that Ashley is still alive on the early morning hours of the 29th. It was crucial in, in trying to pinpoint what her final moments were. We also found really crucial video at a party store, Miss Tracy's, which was in essence right across the street from Jared's house. Inside the store, we see Jared Chance purchasing alcohol and ammonia, a cleaning product. We suspected that some extensive cleaning had been attempted in the apartment, and then we just so happened to have Jared buying cleaning supplies that day. And then on one of the videos, uh, we see that he's approaching, and we see him put something into the garbage bin right outside the front of the business. And of course, that's of interest to us. And that led us to then the dumpster behind the party store, which happened to have Ashley's purse in it. Based on the evidence, we were fairly confident that uh, Jared killed Ashley in the wee hours of the 29th. But this theory remains speculation until authorities can officially confirm the body parts found belong to Ashley. Waiting for the DNA test was one of the worst times of my life. I didn't want to believe and neither did Chris. If this isn't her, then she's still out there somewhere. She's missing. So we're still looking. Ultimately, they came back a few days later and said that all of the evidence that had any sort of blood tissue on it belonged to Ashley Young. So we knew that definitively then that, that Ashley Young had, had died. I never thought anyone could bring that much pain to so many people. I never heard, never thought about murder. You always see it on TV. And it's never going to happen to us. But it does. I just want to know where the rest of Ashley is. I want to bring her home. Investigators are also determined to find the rest of Ashley's body to help them build a stronger case against Jared. They hope his cell phone data might lead them to her. Using cell phone records, we knew that uh, Jared had made his way out to Holland, which is a little city uh, just west of Grand Rapids. And that's where Jared's parents live. Our interest in the parents was they were with Jared on the same day that, that we made the discovery of the body. The fact that Jared wasn't talking to us, we hoped maybe the parents would, would lead us, uh, you know, to some of the answers that we were looking for. And so we go and take a trip to Holland. James Chance, Jared's father, answered the door. I explained to him that we had a search warrant, that this was non-negotiable, that uh, his house was going to be searched. I spent the next several hours with the Chance family while our detectives and other officers and forensic techs processed and searched their house. His father was a retired police officer, and he made a comment about, I'm glad I'm not investigating this case, that this is a tough case. And I started thinking, 
How do you know it's a tough case? What do you know about this? December 5th, 2018. Investigators are at Jared Chance's family home in Holland, Michigan. They want to know if his parents have any information about Ashley Young's murder. But they opted not to speak about specifics without consulting an attorney. While Jared's parents are tight-lipped, the scene inside their home speaks volumes. A sawzall was found in that house. There was tissue observed on the blade. In the Honda CRV, which was in the garage, we found a small trace of blood. They also located a bloody shower curtain that also was connected to Jared's apartment in Grand Rapids. The evidence throughout the home convinces investigators that Jared's parents helped him cover up his crimes. It was a shocking revelation for all of us. Within three to four hours, Jared Chance is charged with murder, and his parents are charged with being accessories after the fact in the mutilation of a body. We learned that they drove to Grand Rapids on Saturday, December 1st. Jared loaded some boxes into their Honda. Jared got in the car, and they proceeded then to return to Holland. One of the main goals is trying to locate Ashley's head, hands, and feet. I appealed to them as parents, you know, trying to get them to, to consider how Ashley's family was feeling. And essentially, I got very little. Jared seemed to be a person prone to violence and unpredictable. He seemed to be a troubled young man that had a lot of various problems and couldn't hold a job, didn't have very close connections to friends and family. Ashley wants to fix people, and I think that that's what she saw in Jared. She was the one person who actually wanted to believe in him and push him to do better. Ashley believed there's always good in everyone. But what she didn't realize is there's not always good in everyone. What changed? What flipped? From the minute that they were at that bar and having the night that they had to what he did to her in a basement. The burning question, what happened in the final moments between Ashley and Jared, remains pure speculation. I think he made a pass at her. That was my first instinct. And she rejected him. And then I think he killed her. The trial begins today for a man accused of murdering and dismembering a Kalamazoo County woman. Whether it was showing these horrific photos to the jury, listening to the forensic techs who had to open up this box and find Ashley's limbs throughout the entire process, Jared showed zero emotion the entire time. Now the trial is in the hands of the jury. The defendant is, under count one, guilty of second-degree murder. Under count two, guilty of tampering with evidence. Ultimately, the jury convicted Jared Chance of second-degree murder, tampering with evidence, of mutilating a body, of uh, failure to report a death. Every single charge that was before them, they convicted him of. Jared Chance is sentenced to 100 to 200 years when the sentencing was handed down. Her mother got in front of this entire courtroom. I cry seven days a week. Seven! Jared Chance, I hate you. I want to rip you limb from limb. Jared's parents now must face justice. Barbara Chance decides to take a plea, and she actually only serves 45 days in jail. But the father 
James decides to take it to trial. James Chance is acquitted of perjury, but is convicted of an accessory after the fact. So he gets a year of probation, including one month of jail. If they would tell us where the rest of Ashley is, we could bring her home. They owe that to her family. They owe that to her friends. Unfortunately, I don't believe that they ever will. I don't think they'll give us that. So anyways, have a good day. I really am going to go get ready for class now. And sorry for talking a lot, but that's just me. If you were lucky enough to have Ashley in your life and she considered you a friend, you know the loss. You know what you lost.